Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to day four. Um, what we're going to do today, and we're just waiting, I can see that we're getting some more um, attendees picking up. So we're just going to give them a, a few minutes to, to get online and get organized this morning. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at what we call um, core programming. So we'll start out um, in the programming environment, setting up a project. So we're going to do a, a Java project. Um, we get some questions um, about C++. And uh, as we stated uh, when we started this week, uh, we're focusing on Java in this training session. Um, however, all of the documentation and all of the presentations will show both the Java code and the C++ code, okay? So you'll have access to both code and if you wanna run your project um, in C++, you'll just follow the C++ um, format that's in the documentation uh, and you, you should be good to go. Um, you know, you just have to be a little bit familiar with it. I, I take it if you're asking about C++, that you're already familiar with the programming environment, um, so you should be able to use that the samples and put uh, and put everything together. So with the core programming, like I said, we need to start somewhere, um, and we're going to start with a project. And this is just getting going to be able to get you used to structure um, and the way that we're going to work um, in the VS Code environment. Okay. Um, and in addition to that, get you a little bit familiar um, with the WIP lib. Uh, why we start using the WIP lib version of VS Code as opposed to just downloading VS Code, okay? And one of the reasons for this is that this project that we're going to create, it sets up a lot of fundamental things for you already um, to work for the robot, okay? So by using this environment, setting up that project, um, a lot of the basic core work to start you um, will be done for that. Um, so with that, what I'll do is I'll... Uh, Make sure that James has his VS Code up and running. Um, his computer's a little faster than mine. Mine takes about four hours to load it, probably because I'm not using a computer, I'm using a tablet. And uh, he'll take you through the project. And then what we're gonna do with that is we're gonna go through each one of the sensors and actuators inside of the World Skills Collection, okay? And we'll step you through and we'll do a little bit of sample and we'll add that after some theory um, to the project going forward. Um, we will not be looking at the camera today. We decided to separate the vision um, from the core uh, programming structures. So we'll get uh, some vision tomorrow and we'll look at some samples um, of vision tomorrow. Um, so with that, I will pass you over to James to start to set up the project. And we're just looking here. I think we're waiting for about another 10 people, but we'll get started regardless. So uh, I've opened up VS Code here, and we are going to create a new project to start today. To so open up the command palette, you can hit F1, or you can use, as you can see here, Control Shift P. Right now, just just one point. You'll notice that when James hits F1, okay, and he gets that command palette, you're going to see all those um, WPI lib functions come up. If I had uh, not followed our install instructions and installed the version of VS code that we have through our online installer and through our downloader, you would not have any of this functionality in there. Okay. So you want to make sure that you follow our instructions so that it will actually install this. And when you start your VS code, you'll have that separate icon from a VS code icon. So if you already have it on your system, you'll still have that other icon but you're gonna start it with the correct version that contains everything that's already, all the libraries that are default, except for some of the vendor libraries we must add, um, already set up for you, okay? So I just wanna make sure you understand that because if you're like me, uh, you can get confused. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna type in, create a, oops, and you can see there's one option available. So we're going to click it. And then you'll see the WPI project creator come up. So we're going to select a project type. In this case, we're going to choose a template. You can choose an example if you want, but we're going to go with the template. We're going to be using Java. 
and we're going to create a command style robot. Then we need to choose a folder to place the new project into. So I put in the project that I want to, uh, folder that I want to use. And I have to give a project name. So let's go with example. Then we need to enter a team number. If we remember back to yesterday where we showed the how the Wi-Fi works with the VMX, how we had world skills dash one, two, three, four. That dash one, two, three, four is our team number. So I'm gonna put in one, two, three, four. Now, um, just on that, we do use this. And in the past, what we've done for world skills um, before you reach the competition is we had actually created every country, we had created a number for them and it was all based upon their um, long distance calling code, okay? So for an, an example, um, I was uh, gonna be Canada, it would be 0011, okay? So every country has a calling code. So before we got to the competition, we had assigned a number based on the country calling code for everybody. Um, and I had a chart for when we were connecting, okay? So uh, at this point in time, if you want to use a number, you can do what we did, which is um, one, two, three, four. Uh, or if we find that at a competition environment, um, it's going to cause an issue. Then beforehand, what we do is we issue you with that um, code um, when we send out the instructions for the competition, okay? Um, but at this point in time, you're, you're just using it, uh, like James said, so you can enter in any number. This number can be changed after. So now we just enter it, so it's set. But if you were to change it later, you can change this number. So we're going to hit Generate Project. Then we can say, would we like to open VS Code in a, the current window or a new window? What happens here is, hey, yes, it'll our current window will change to this project. If I hit a new window, it'll open up a new instance of VS Code, which I'm gonna do. I'm gonna open up a new instance. So I'm gonna hit new window. And when you first open up the, well, create a new project, it's going to build the project to create all the dependencies and link them up correctly. As you can see, the everything's changing here. So depending upon the speed of your computer, it'll take a while um, to build the project um, and put it together. Um, but basically it's gonna do a lot of the initial um, work for you um, when it's gonna set everything up. Okay. And now we can see here, we have our example project structure. So inside our SRC, so our source code, we have all of the functions that we saw yesterday, except the gamepad control, because we will be creating that. If you look in the vendor libraries, there are no libraries installed except for the WPI library. So we'll be showing you how to import the new libraries into the project. This needs to be done for every project that you do. It does not carry between uh, VS Code. Go back to the PowerPoint. Sure. You want to go over the, the limit, limit switch right now? We'll do some basic I.O. Uh, yeah. All right. Okay. So the first thing that we're going to do um, is we're just going to do a simple uh, basic I.O. So there's a couple of things that, that we could choose to do with this. We could use a, a sensor, but since we're going to do them anyways, um, inside the world skills uh, collection, somebody's raised their hand. Do you have a question? Or is it just saying hi? Let's see. All right. 
Miguel, did you have a question? Just throw that up in the chat. I see you raised your hand. Um, so I'm not quite sure, but uh, there's no problem. Okay. All right. So the first thing that we decided to do was um, you are provided with limit switches uh, inside of your um, collection. A limit switch can be used for any basic function. With the new uh, Titan controller for your limit switch input for your motors, we actually um, have that put directly okay, uh, linked up with each motor. So M0 has a high and low limit, M1 has a high and low limit. So you can actually plug right into that functionality if you're gonna use limit switches to control um, the motion of the motors. But if you're gonna use them um, for anything else, it would simply be a, a little bit of a basic IO so that you can see it. So what we do um, for the basic IO is we simply just took a, a sample limit switch that we have um, to make things easy for us, I grabbed one uh, that has screw terminals on it, okay? We don't usually use these on the robot because they can come loose and pull apart. So when we do the robot, we actually um, crimp them up and put them on there. Uh, but for training, we put that together. Um, this is just a simple monetary switch, um, a general purpose micro switch. It could be a tac could be used as a, as a tactile bumper. So in the past, we've had people put these on the front of the robot and they've moved the robot you know, to a, back to a wall and engage the limit switch just to make sure that both limit switches are active um, in order to, to line that up, okay? So you know, a lot of times in world skills, you see people line it up and they're trying to use the, uh, the ultrasonic distance sensor or they're trying to use a sharp IR sensor. And I, I know that we did this one year, I says, why don't you just put a limit switch there? And when it backs in slowly to, the, to a flat surface, it hits the limit switch and it gets a contact, okay? Um, I used a gray and a white wire on this one uh, when we wired it up. They are wired into the flex DIO header, okay, is, is where we put them there. And the reason is, is because the flex DIO headers allow for both input and output, okay? Um, when we talk, and I'll go over a little bit about the next um, headers over, remember that those are all set to default output. So here we're trying to get um, an input. So the gray wire is on the common on the limit switch and the white wire is on the normally open contact um, by default. And we are just gonna wire that in and it's connected to channel 11, okay? With a couple of uh, male to female jumper wires. That's all that's gonna happen reading that basic digital IO, okay? Um, you've got some um, sample code for this to support the digital input. Um, James will take you through the Java code uh, but the C++ code is there as well. Um, you'll see that it is uh, commented, so it's great, it's commented properly, right? So that we can see that we're just gonna get a true value or a high signal uh, for a high signal and a false value for a low signal um, to know that we have an input um, from the limit switch. So I will pass that back over. Okay. So we're back into the blank project here. Now, before we create the limit switch, we need to create a subsystem to put the limit switch into. By default, there's an example subsystem inside the folder. We're going to actually delete the, we'll ignore it for now, not delete it. So if you right click on the subsystem folder, you can create a new file. You'll see here there's a text box that opens up. I'm gonna call it training.java. It is important to, when you create the file name, to always put the extension as well. If you were in C++ project, then you'd add a CPP a file extension or a .h file extension if you're doing a header file. I'm hit enter. And now it's created the file. However, the file is blank. No, there's a question. There is a question in the chat if you want to answer. Oh, if I can, I will answer it. So as you can see, it's blank. So we need to start adding things to the subsystem. First thing is we need to notice that the pack that this file is inside the subsystem package. So what we're going to do is we're going to go package FRC. Oh, I spelled package. 
robot dot stuff. You can see that the intelligence on the NVS code will help try and solve it for you. And I've now included the package. So this ties training to the subsystems properly. Then we're going to create the class itself. So I'll move this down and leave space for the imports. So we want a public class so that it can be accessed from the outside. Training. And we remember we have to extend the subsystem base. Now what's nice is when you start uh, adding different objects, most of the time it will auto import the object for you as it did here, as I did not need to type in this import. Now that we've created this, let's create the digital sensor. So I'm going to create java.com and say sensors. Now we want it to be private, so it can only be accessed internally. If you remember from the code that Derek showed in the PowerPoint, we are using the digital input class, as you can see here. We're going to call it switch. Now, if you notice, it did not auto import the digital input object. So if you click on the digital input object, you'll see this yellow magnifying glass, oh, yellow light bulb, sorry. If you were to click on it, you can then see I can import the digital input, I can create a digital import, and all these other options. We're gonna actually import the digital input. You can see it adds it to the top there. Now you can see VS Code is giving us an error, uh, a warning, not an error. This under, this yellow uh, underline underneath limit switch, we can hover over it and it says, the value of training dot limit switch is not used, which is true because we have not used this limit switch yet. Now that we've defined the object, we need to first define the constructor in order for this to work. So we're gonna create the constructor, so public, Training. There's the constructor. And now we need to create a new instance of limit switch. So sensors. As you can see, the IntelliSense sees that we have limit switch. So we can hit that equals new digital input. It already picks it up. As Derek showed, we are on channel 11. So I'm going to put in one, one, and then add the delimiter to end it. Now, now, if you notice, there is still not used here because we have created the instance, but we have not actually used it to get or set any data. So what we're going to do is let's create a simple accessor method. So we want to be able to retrieve this from the outside. So we public Boolean get limit switch. Now you'll see now there's an error underneath get limit switch. This is because we've created an accessor method that requires a return as said here, this method must return a result of type Boolean. We're not returning anything yet. So what we can do is this, return limit switch. And if we hit dot, we can get the methods inside of limit switch, which is part digital input. And we can see here, get. There's also different options here that you can use if you want to. However, we're gonna use get. If we hover over get, you can see what it returns. So as we can see, it gets the value from the digital input channel retrieved 
the value of a single digital input. And it returns the status of the digital input in a Boolean. And as we've added the return statement, get limit switch no longer has an error. And as we are now using limit switch, limit switch no longer has a warning to say that we're not using. And that's as simple as adding the limit switch code. However, we want to actually know what the limit switch code does. If we hover over it right now, it doesn't say anything. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a Java doc comment. So slash star star. You see it hovers Java doc comment. When hit enter, it'll auto create the tag for us so that we can know. So I'm going to say this method returns the value of the limit switch. I'm going to add in a space here. Returns true or well, we can say boolean value of limit switch on port. Because we know it's port 11, we can put 11. However, if you were to change it, you'd have to go manually changing the comment. Now, if we hover over get, get limit switch, we can see there's now a comment block that accompanies it. So this method returns the value of the limit switch. And then we can see the return, the Boolean value of the limit switch on port 11. Simple. Now I'm going to pass it back over to Derek and he'll move on to the next sensor. We'll be showing all the sensors after we're done on the robot, on the uh, training platform, and we can go through each one live. Excellent. OK, so just a quick um, digital input, just to get you used to uh, to working in the VS Code environment. OK, um, you can see that it is uh, it is fairly straightforward. And once you get some practice and take a look at this um, sample code um, that we provide, you'll have all the core that you need um, to be able to start to put together and build a robot project. OK, um, I'm also quite sure that, like I said, as we get going forward, as you post stuff, and remember, if you have questions, we work on the form, the WSR form. Um, you know, we put little samples and things up there because if you ask us a question, uh, we will respond so that everybody can see it. All right, um, very, very, uh, very, very open is what we're trying to do here. So we'll talk about the um, the next uh, system here. Um, so I'll just share my screen again. All right. Uh, there on my screen, you're going to see the sample code for both the Java and the C++. Okay. Uh, James added a few more comments into the code this time, uh, just so that you can see it and have a look at it. But this code is up on the uh, WSR docs page. Okay. So the uh, WSR.studica docs page that was on our slide on the first day. And you could actually just cut and paste this code in. Um, please remember, if you do that, though, that your project has to be set up correctly first, right? Um, because it's designed for use in the way that the project was set up uh, that James had just put together. All right. Okay. Now we're going to do the, uh, the line sensor board. And like James said, what we're going to do here is we're going to work in one project. We're going to put everything into that project. And then at the end of it, we're going to show it all to you together in one environment, which in our case, we're going to use the trainer um, that we go forward, all right? So inside of your uh, collection, you get what we call the, the good old Cobra line sensor board, all right? Um, the Cobra line sensor board has uh, four IR LED photo transistor pairs, um, and they're mounted on a nine millimeter pitch, okay? So what that means is it means a center to center distance uh, on that. The reason that we did nine millimeter pitch was so that we could standardize on the width of black tape that was used around the world. Okay. Why don't you stop sharing? I can show. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll just quickly. Uh, James wants me to stop sharing. We'll do that. So we're just going to go back and verify and show the where we are on the docs page here. For you. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the line sensor. Oh, he's going to show you the pitch. Okay, good. If you see. There's evenly spaced between here. 
on the top of the line sensor, there's this line. So we went off the base electrical tape, which is three quarter inches or 19.05 millimeters. And that's what this line is at the top. It represents that. Now, if we notice that line also equals the distance between this sensor and this sensor, so that the two sensors are on the opposite side of a black line with two sensors in the middle for extra help. So you don't have to use all four sensors. If you don't want to, you can only use the outside ones or you could just use the inside ones, it's up to you. But we're just explaining how there's a line there to represent the max width of a tape that can be used. Okay, cool. All right. So a little bit of background knowledge about this um, is, is up here so that you can see it. Uh, remember that it's based upon um, voltage, okay? So you'll get different voltage readings. Yesterday when we showed you the sample uh, overall project, um, we had taken the white piece of paper and put it under the sensor and removed it. Our table here is, is very, very dark. So when the white paper was removed, the voltage had actually gone up to 4.99907. Okay. So that had a, a low reflectivity surface. So it went all the way to five volts. So when we work with this, we look at this between a, a threshold value, as we call it. Um, and you're going to see that we do set a threshold value uh, within the code so that you can do that. All right. These values are going to change based upon the height that, okay, the sensor is installed at. So the optimal height for the sensor generally uh, is going to be between three and five millimeters. Okay. Um, however, you know, it, it, you might have to change it um, as your robot moves. If it's doing different things that may change as well. Okay. So you do need to calibrate your sensors. You do need to calibrate your sensor for local light conditions, all right? There is a daylight filter that's built into the sensor. So if you've got some sun shining in on one side of it, um, it should be fairly, uh, fairly okay. Uh, it's gonna try to filter out a lot of that daylight, but just remember that, you know, hey, it worked perfect when I was in X room or X environment but when you get into a different competition space, okay, you need to calibrate your sensor. And you need to check that every day because lights change uh, every day as well, okay? So uh, overall, uh, there's a high voltage range there, um, so it shouldn't be that difficult when you're going to do it, okay? Um, this is the sample code for this sensor. We have it for both um, Java and for C++. You'll notice that in this case, we are importing the uh, library. So there is a library that's been written for this sensor um, and it needs to be imported. And you'll see that the accessor method if we're working in Java is gonna output either voltage zero to five or the raw ADC value, which is zero to 2047. And I think we had shown that yesterday and I'm pretty sure you'll, you'll have a look at that again today. Okay, so that's the Cobra, the LSB, um, the data sheets have more information on them, uh, but I think that pretty well explains everything right there without going into too much uh, detail. It's a fairly simple sensor uh, and quite easy to use. So I'll stop sharing and we'll get James to go back and we'll add the code to the project file. So before we can actually use the COBRA code as it's part of the Studica library, we have to import the Studica library. So to import the Studica library, we need to first grab the vendor link from the docs page. So if we see we're at docs.wsr.studica.com, we go to software, there's programming. So inside programming, we can see adding vendor library to choose adding vendor library. So there are instructions here on how to add the vendor library. And then there's the link that we need to copy in. So I'm going to copy this link. I'm going to go back to VS Code. I'm going to open up the command palette. And I'm going to click on manage vendor libraries, as we see here. 
And then you'll see there's a bunch of options. I can check for updates offline or online, or I can install new libraries offline or online. I'm going to install a new library online. It'll then ask me to enter a vendor file URL. I'm going to enter this URL and hit enter. I think it, VS Code will now ask me to build after the vendor update to ensure its dependencies are installed correctly. We want to hit yes, because what will happen is when we hit build, it'll now grab the library from the internet and cache it into your local Maven for this project. So I'm going to hit yes. And you can notice here at the bottom, it's going to download all the files. And boom, done. Doesn't take a long time. It's pretty quick. So someone's asking if we can add text for the constructor. Yeah. So this is the constructor. Let me put a comma here. Constructor. And then this is the accessor method. Okay. And now after we've imported the library, if we go to vendor depths here, we can now see that the Studica library is there. So what we're going to do is now we're going to, as we're making another sensor, we can go private Cobra. As you can see, it's detected Cobra. It's Cobra. It's imported the Cobra. And then Again, we haven't used Cobra yet, so it has the underline. I'm going to create a new Cobra. So Cobra equals new Cobra. Now, if we remember, there's two different uh, methods of using Cobra. If you're on five volts, you can use the normal constructor. However, if you're using a different voltage for the Cobra, such as 3.3 volts, we would type in 3.3 F. This, this way we are telling the Cobra that this is the reference voltage on the sensor. However, we're using five volts, so we're not going to pass any voltage in. Now to uh, access the Cobra, we're going to create another accessor method, so public. This time it'll be a double, actually, an int, get raw cobra value. So what we've done here is we've told it that it's public, so it can be accessed from outside training.java We'll be returning an integer, integer. This is the method name. And the method requires a parameter called channel. Now we want to get rid of the error here. So we're going to say, if we look at the error, it'll say this method must return the result of type int. That's because of the int here. So return. Now remember, we're going to do cobra dot. And we can see here, we want to use the get raw value. You'll see channel matches channel, and we can block out with that. Now we need to add the javadoc comment so that we understand what this accessor method is. So we're going to do slash star star. 
And as you can see, now this time we have a parameter. So we can see a parameter is being added. So I'm going to put in the general description, this method grab, grabs, oh, we can keep it simple, returns the raw ADC value from the Cobra plugged into the ADC expansion. And I'm going to add a space. Now the parameter channel is the expansion or channel. So what I said is the expansion board channel we want to get. In this case, and the range is zero to three. Returns a raw ADC value from zero to 2047. Now, if I hover over get raw cover value, we can now see it's exactly what I just typed it. Now there's another function of, we wanna read what the voltage is coming from the Cobra. So we're gonna add another accessor method. So public, this time it will be a double. Get Cobra voltage in. Again, this time we must return a result of type double. So we're going to do return Cobra dot get voltage in two. Again, channel and channel match. I'm going to add a Java doc comment for this. So I'm going to say this method returns the voltage from Cobra on into the ADC expansion board. Add a space. The expansion or channel we want to get zero to three. Returns the voltage from the Cobra. And the range is zero five volts or zero to three point three. Volts put star line in here if uh, equals cobra. What I said here in the comment is the return voltage from the Cobra is this or this if equals new Cobra 3.3F is used. So therefore we can know in the constructor, if we use 3.3F, this is the output reach. And that's it for now for the Cobra, right? So he's just um, commenting that out. He's, he's basically setting the threshold of the range, okay? Um, so that you can determine what side of the range you're on um, to decide what you want to do with the value when you are going to use the sensor. Okay. So, you know, as you get more experience with that and you go through it, it'll be there. We're commenting that code uh, just for you in this training a little bit more than the sample code uh, is commented. So if I went back and looked at the sample code, I'll just share my screen again.
All right. You'll see there's some um, there's some sample code there. We're using the 3.3 as well, um, but there's just a little bit less uh, commenting there for you. I mean, it's a great idea to comment your code. It helps people understand uh, what's going on uh, and what's going to happen. I know a lot of times we used to have people run other people's code or debug other people's code um, and just swap it back and forth in a classroom environment uh, and see if they could figure it out just uh, just based upon the comments. Okay. So that'll give you a start um, on the Cobra on the line sensor. Uh, once we integrate that onto the actual unit and you see what it does, you'll be able to see what those values are going to be, uh, return as we go through. Okay. Um, when you wire up that Cobra, okay, uh, what you want to do is there's a little section in here is remember that we have to use the, um, the ADC. Okay. So uh, we just use some... Uh, in your package, you're going to have a, the ADC. You're also going to have some uh, DuPont cables, okay, so that you can see it. So there's a sample wiring diagram for it to bring it into the ADC. Um, you'll see the th four analog channels there. I'm just using uh, yellow, green, yellow, green, okay, but I've got the voltage on black and I've got the uh, ground, or sorry, the voltage on red, the source on red, and the ground on black. Okay, so that'll plug directly into the analog module, and then you'll use the supplied um, JSTSH to JSTGH cable, and you're going to plug that into the uh, I2C port on the VMX. All right. So a little bit of a blurb there about what it does. Encounters a white material, reflects light, voltage becomes small, has a black material, uh, the voltage becomes large, and then you're going to adjust that threshold value, and you're using 3.3 volts, right? Okay, which is probably um, middle of the range. So quick point on how to hook it up, nice and simple now, uh, nice and easy for you. You don't have to do any extra wiring. Um, all you probably wanna do is, is make yourself a little harness for this and maybe bind those up. We're using single DuPont connectors here, uh, but you can make one wiring harness uh, ahead of time based upon where your sensor is gonna go um, just to control that. And that of course is if you're gonna use um, that line follower sensor uh, for any reason at all. All right. Okay. Um, so the sample code is there as well. All right. We're going to talk about talk about the um, the IR distance sensor right now uh, that's included in the uh, collection. This is a sharp IR distance sensor. There's uh, multiple versions, so the product number is there. Uh, each one can work a little bit different and each one has a different uh, range, okay, that you can work through when you're going to go through. So this is the GP2Y0821YKOF uh, is what that's going to be for your sharp IR distance sensor, all right? It generally has a range of about 10 centimeters to 80 centimeters. Um, it's an analog sensor. So remember that when we're trying to get an input, we're going to wire this sensor up to an analog input, okay? Um, the size is there, it's 4.5 volts to 5.5 volts, and it draws about um, 30 uh, milliamps. So just some general information for you um, from the data sensor. How would we use this sensor? Uh, we could use this sensor for a lot of different things. We could use it as a, as a proximity sensor. Uh, we could use it as a touchless switch to turn something on and off, right? Uh, for proximity, are we close to an object? Are we far away from an object? All right, and we can use it to measure the range or distance as well. So, you know, it'll try to approximate and range within 15 centimeters, 20 centimeters. You do need to remember that when you're using any sensor on a mobile robot, that the robot probably needs a little bit of time, okay? Because as it's moving, it's continually processing data. So, you know, you may have to pause a little bit so they can normalize a reading um, when it's going to work, but you'll begin to uh, read that as you go forward and work on it. All right. A um, couple of things about the principles of, of operation on this sensor. It's got a light emitter and then it has a light detector or PSD. Okay. So basically what happens is the, the IR light emitter, uh, the LED will send out a light signal. Okay. Um, that is going to then hit an object, right? And it's going to return they bounce back to the sensor IR detector, okay, or the PSD, uh, right? And what we're technically doing here when we do that is we're measuring the angle um, that is created, 
so that we can calculate the distance. Because if we know this angle, this angle, and this angle, we can do math, okay? So beam of infrared light reflects off the object um, to measure the distance. It's calculated, like I said, using the triangulation of the beam, okay? It's got the LED and the PSD. Um, and when it goes back and forward, we'll do a little bit of math for it, okay? So there's your ranging principle diagram. Right? There'll be a set point on your image, um, either A and B. So this will give you the theory of operation on how that sensor works, okay? So one thing to note about it is, would the sensor be good for reflection on a round object? Uh, I'll let you decide that, okay? Um, what I would do is I would be doing tests to see what kind of readings I was gonna get with the sensor and how the reflectivity of the beam when it bounces back, okay, works off certain objects. Uh, generally in world skills, you have a white, okay, um, or a white wall, right? Because we're using white melamine. So it's solid, it's, it's good to go. But remember, if there's other objects within the environment, okay, they may not work properly because the reflectivity of the light beam um, may change, all right? Okay, um, these are the principles of operation of the sensor. Um, I pulled this from the, uh, from the data sheet, okay? Um, and what you'll look at this basically is that you're gonna get a different voltage range based upon the distance that you are away, okay? So you'll see why the detection range based in this graph starts at about 10 centimeters, okay? And that is that anything below um, 10 centimeters, the, the voltage range just spikes. So you can't get an accurate um, reading app off that, okay? Uh, because what we can't do is we can't put a curve fit on there in order to, uh, to make that work, okay? So the usable detection range generally um, starts about 10 centimeters, which for voltage reading is usually around 2.3 volts with this sensor, all right? So you'll also notice the response is nonlinear. Um, so you'll see that as you change the voltage, it's not completely linear, okay, for the distance for the reflective object, all right? So in order to do that, we have to use a function uh, with the sensor that's going to convert the output voltage into a range. Uh, the basic uh, formula is there for the distance in centimeters uh, with the function, okay? Um, but you'll see that generally, you know, we can do a few different things with this as we go forward, all right? If you wanted to improve the accuracy of the readings, you could do um, measure the actual voltage at various distances, all right? And you could actually create your own uh, math, your own formula that would take the several sa samples and do a post-fit curve, okay? Um, and that way you can try to get the smallest mean error. Uh, but we're just going to use the sample code uh, because we find that generally the formula will work uh, fairly well, all right? But that's not to say that you can't go through and do a curve fit analysis on it, all right, and, uh, and make it work through. When you're going to wire the sharp uh, IR distance sensor, Okay, it's gonna be wired into the VMX using the analog input header. So there's the analog input header there. Uh, remember that we talked about the fact that by default, there's only four analog inputs that are configured, right? Um, so that's one of the reasons why when we do the uh, line sensor board, we're using the ADC and going to the uh, I2C port, okay? Because that would take up four analog inputs right there. And we may have to go through and, and reconfigure the VMX. So this way, you can use your line sensor board. You can use your two analog inputs uh, from your two sharp IRs, okay? And then you've still got at least two extras that you could use um, if need be, right? Um, black goes to ground, red goes to the source voltage, right? And white goes to the analog input. Uh, like Earhart asked yesterday, uh, watch those diagrams because some of the ones got a couple of differences uh, on those cables. So we showed that. So you'll notice that um, coming out of the sharp IR, it's red, black, white, but going into the, um, the VMX, it's black, red, white, okay? So the cable is, uh, is flipped. Um, the new cables give you three so that you can connect those correctly. 
Uh, in this example, what we're doing is we're going to take the Sharp IR, we're going to connect it to channel 22. Um, we're going to use the 3JST to PWM cable, and that's where we will connect it. And just so you know, all the pictures that are in these presentations for you to connect are what we're showing in the sample code today. So if you wire everything up to test it and you're wiring it to these inputs um, and you're just copying the code or cutting and pasting, uh, this will all, well, you can't really cut and paste from the recorded webinar, sorry. Um, but if you have the example. Yeah, but you have the example, you will have the example project and that example project, everything is wired up this way as a good sample and a good test, okay? Um, so the code, here's the code, uh, both in Java and C++, okay? Um, so we're gonna start with by importing the uh, analog input library. Uh, and from here, I'll let uh, James go back. And there's that math formula, okay, that I talked about uh, set up for you already. So a lot of the uh, a lot of the work is uh, is done. So I'll let him go on, and he'll add this to the project. So before we, oh, there's a question. No, that's because that was lab view, which is different. This is something else. Yeah. So you don't need to add the 20 millisecond delay for this, right? Um, because of the way that lab view was running on a, on a real time processor. Okay. You needed to add that delay uh, just because of the functionality of it. Okay. Here, the controller is going to take care of that for you. Um, so there's no need to add that delay. So one thing to note is on the VMX, it shows digital port uh, 22 to 25 for the analog input. However, in that's the digital pin. When you're actually programming the uh, analog input, we're gonna notice if we go to the VMX section of the docs page, there'll be a WPI channel addressing tab. So we're gonna click on that you can, we're going to scroll on to the analog input channel address. So if you notice here, you have 22, 23, 24, 25. That's the digital pin. However, the addressing in VS code will be 0, 1, 2, 3. So we'll remember that for when we create the code here. So we're going to add a new uh, sharp sensor. So we need the analog input class. So we're going to private analog and there it is, analog input. I'm going to call it sharp. If you notice, the analog input class was imported. We haven't used it yet, so it's underlined. So we use sharp is equal to a new analog input. Now the channel, if you remember back to the here, we are plugged into 22, which is analog input zero. So I'm gonna put zero. Now we need to, now that we've created the instance, we need to create an accessor method to actually read what the value is. So I'm going to create one here. So public double get IR distance. Now if you see we got an error because we haven't created the return statement. So we're going to return. Uh, how? I'm just inputting the formula that we know from the uh, PowerPoint slide and I'll go over how it works. So we're gonna use now the sharp class. We're gonna use get average voltage. So if we notice the average voltage gets a scaled sample from the output of the oversample in average engine for this channel. So essentially what's gonna happen is it's going to grab a whole bunch of samples, it's going to average them, and it might oversample a bit, 
and we'll get a good average voltage that will come in. And then we're setting it to the power of minus 1.2045. And then we have to multiply it by 27.726. So let's go over this line and what's going on. So here we're using a static call to the math library of Java. Math is a built-in function of Java, so we don't need to import it or anything along with that we're also calling it statically. So we're just typing math.pow. What this is, is it's saying we're grabbing the power function from Java. The power function has two parameters. If I hope, oh, it's not going to so if we notice there's an A and a B, so there's A and B. So the power is, it's the first parameter to the power of the second parameter. If we remember from the formula shown in the PowerPoint, it's our voltage that we sample to the power of negative 1.2045. This gives us our curve. And then we times it by the offset of 27.726 to give us our final voltage value. Well, not our volt, it'll convert the voltage to the distance in centimeter. So knowing that, we can now create our java.common. So I'm saying so this method returns the distance from the sharp IR sensor. And it returns the distance in centimeters, and the range is 10 centimeters to 80 centimeters. And it's as simple as that. Someone says, hi, what if we need more analog inputs, say eight? There are four analog inputs on the VMX and there are four analog inputs on the analog module, so that gives you your eight analog inputs. However, there are only six analog inputs that are given in the collection, and if you use more than that, then you will lose points. Yes, so there's, there's other ways to do it as well if you're just going to use this um, uh, as a general controller. Um, the reason that there's that many right now is that in, in a world skills collection, you, you are uh, limited. Um, so you have more than enough analog inputs for the sensors that are provided. Okay. Um, you know, so it's, it's up to you what you want to use it for after that. Um, if you're going to use it outside of that, you could, you could add another ADC, right? Um, so you can add an extra ADC. Um, you could reconfigure some of the I.O. Uh, on the VMX as well. Um, but out of the box for world skills, you will not um, require any more analog input. Okay. Did you finish that sensor off? Yep. Okay. So it's uh, 9 a.m. What we'll do is we'll take a 15 minute break um, and we will come back and we'll jump over on to our next sensor. Uh, what we'll do is maybe we can leave your project up in case people are trying to type in and, uh, and follow along uh, just so that you can see that and you would be able to, uh, to catch up and see what you're going to get. Um, if you need to uh, do any wiring uh, later, what we'll do is we'll take a quick break. If you're trying to wire this up and I'll go back and I'll uh, show you those slides again. Uh, when we start, we'll just review them. Um, so that you can go through and, and hook up a couple of sensors if you're doing that in your environment as well. So we'll see everybody at uh, quarter past the hour. All right, take care. Bathroom now. I need to code up.
Hi, everyone. Uh, we're back again. We're, we're excited. We're going live uh, 32 seconds early. Okay. That's how excited we are this morning. We're good to go. So we're going to answer some questions we got in the meantime. So one person asked, when we see, when, we, when will we see the example of getting encoders value via the Titan? Uh, currently, the encoder class needs to be rewritten as it's too complicated for an end user. As right now, it's in the James mind of code. So, uh, if I can, we can show it to you when we get to the motor example, but it's uh, very complicated for someone that doesn't understand the way that I programmed it. Uh, another person asked, is it possible to connect the Pi to an Ethernet port on my router or is the Ethernet port disabled? The Ethernet port is enabled. However, if you connect to the VMX through Ethernet, you'll have to statically set your IP address on your computer to that domain that the VMX is on, so that 10.xx.xx.x. Or you can run the setup Wi Fi client which will then connect you to the internet, which means you can then use an external router for your Wi-Fi and stuff through the ethernet. Or if you plug in the ethernet, you'll get the local IP address that it uses. Okay, so um, so in short, number one, um, the encoder class, we'll show you where it is now. Um, I thought it was a little bit too complicated for, for most people. Um, so we are going to uh, simplify that, and then that class will be published and, and redone. So we will be doing motor control uh, and DC motor control and servo uh, control in a little bit. Um, so we will go over that. Um, just one point about connecting uh, to the Pi portion of the VMX controller over Ethernet. Um, it's there. Everything is still there for the Pi. But remember that our documentation and our code and everything that we're doing is setting this up to communicate with your device as a robot controller. So Sheldon, in short, if you eh, everything, you eh, everything, remember that, okay? So it's very difficult for us to get back in and, and uh, reset things uh, and so on. So you know what, if you wanna buy two or three and connect, I'm all for that, um, buy two or three. Um, but keep one as the default because that's going to be the one for the robot controller. All right. Or make sure you have a thorough understanding of it um, and document what you did so that we can help you undo what you did. All right. Uh, and that, that would be the concern that I, that I would have going forward. I'm a firm believer in the um, KISS principle. How's that? Okay. All right. So we're going to go, uh, go forward here and we'll look at the, uh, the next uh, sensor. So I'll give you a little bit of, uh, of sensor theory um, first, and then we'll add that sensor into our project. All right. So the ultrasonic distance sensor. All right. So the ultrasonic distance sensor, uh, we've changed the ultrasonic distance sensor in the uh, 2021 collection. Okay. So this ultrasonic sensor is now a four pin module. Um, we were not using the three pin module anymore. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that we can actually get a little bit better distance, okay? And a better practical distance out of it while trying to reduce the cost and simplicity to you in the collection, all right? So we don't have to run the code on FPGA. We don't have to do a lot of different things. So from a robotic standpoint, it just makes it a little bit more um, practical uh, and when I say practical, I say that because the theory of design of this code now matches 20 sensors that are out there in the real world, as opposed to one sensor that is out there in the real world. Okay. So this is a four pin um, sensor. So you're going to have to just take a little bit of note uh, when we're wiring up these, uh, these inputs so that you can look at it. All right. Um, so the pin configuration is there. Uh, some of the features are here, operating current, operating frequency for the sound, uh, and so on. Okay, uh, I don't know if you run this ultrasonic distance sensor with your dog in the room. Okay, I haven't either. So, you know, remember that it's using sound. So let's not, uh, let's not get our dogs all upset. Okay. 
Um, the basic principle of operation is here uh, in my curriculum documents that I'm, I'm putting together um, for what we're trying to do, by the way, is, is create a mobile robotic certification um, for world skills that we're pretty excited about. Um, so there's a little bit of theory of operation here for you, okay? Um, we're basically transmitting an ultrasonic wave. The wave's going to travel in air. When it hits a material, okay, it will get reflected back, and the wave is then taken back in by the ultrasonic receiver module. So by CIR sensor that um, sends out light, okay, in this case, we are going to transmit and receive um, an ultrasonic wave um, to the object. So just some rough theory on the way that this works. Okay, um, so the sound waves are going to be there. The sound waves will travel at 340 um, meters per second. Okay, and hopefully, if there is an object in front, it will get reflected back. Okay, so there's a little bit of information here about um, the speed of sound at 20 degrees Celsius for you, um, and the math formula for it: distance is equal to speed over time, right? Uh, except that you got to remember that because we're sending and receiving. We then need to divide that by two, right? So just a little bit of uh, theory on the way that uh, that this center works, uh, so that people will uh, will understand how it's working, uh, you know, with the sound wave, right? Also remember that the speed of sound changes with temperature. Okay, what we're finding in our environment is that generally we're probably at around 20 degrees to 23 degrees Celsius. So for our mobile robotics environment that we work in in world skills, um, we would actually neglect to use um, a temperature variable to adjust for the speed of sound, all right? And you know, with the accuracies that we are looking for with this sensor, um, generally that, that's what we're gonna work out is, is 20 degrees Celsius, okay? So you know, I wouldn't panic in a room and say, ah, it's 24.2 degrees Celsius in here. Um, and therefore my sensor isn't working correctly. Uh, it, it's not gonna make that much of a difference at all um, for what we are doing in the world skills environment, okay? Um, the echo works on objects that can reflect back sound, okay? It'll work up to 3.3 meters away. Um, you will not have that, that far of a distance when working on your competition court, okay? You should take note that small objects do not reflect sound as well. Okay, um, hard surface cylinders, ball shaped objects work well if you're directly facing that object. Okay, so if you have a round object like my Clorox wipes here and I'm directly facing it, it will work well. If I'm facing it at an angle, it may not work well or it may pick up another object as we go further back. Okay, so when you approach walls, um, you'll just see there's some theory here. If the object is too small, if you're at an angle to the wall, or if you have a soft object, okay, it may not bounce or it may not echo. So I tell people the example I use is that if you have a stuffed animal and you put the stuffed an animal on your competition court, um, it may not work that well, right? Uh, even though we think James is a big huggable guy, okay, he's still not a stuffed animal, therefore it would work well on. So there. That's my attempt at theory, right? Um, applications for this sensor to be used. So this sensor can be used to avoid and detect obstacles, okay? Um, it can be used to measure distance. It can be used to map objects, and it can be used to um, look at the depth of objects as well. So if you had to measure a depth distance, like an opening of a pit, or try to estimate how deep something is that you're looking inside of with your robot, you can try to measure the distance and return that value, okay? So if we gave you a, a, you know, an Explorer robot application and you had to measure a group of distances of, of boxes, for instance, or depths of shafts, you could try to use this sensor to do that. You could try to use the IR sensor to do that, all right? So there's just a sample um, robot task that you could do it. We find in world skills what a lot of people will use the sensor for is either for um, object detection or some of them will use two sensors just to try to uh, line up an object, for instance, or line up the robot to an object if they're then going to, as an example, reset the yaw to zero 
um, on the uh, on the IM. All right. Uh, this is the wiring for this sensor for the example that we've got. Okay. Um, this sensor is going to be wired to the flex uh, DIO. Okay. And you'll notice that we are using two of the channels on the flex DIO because we have the trigger pin, uh, which in my case is yellow, which is on S8. Okay. And the echo, which is on S9. And these are both on the S pin or the signal pin. The power is supplied only off, in my case, channel eight. Okay. Um, and they are labeled. So you can see in my picture right here, they're labeled. It's nice and clear for you. And I've given you a picture there so that you can see how that's simply wired up for the example that James is going to do. Okay. Um, here's your sample code. Once again, both in Java and in uh, C++. If you want to try this sample code, you can go to the docs page, you can cut, and you can paste, all right? Uh, and you can put that in, um, provided that you've set up, once again, the rest of the project. So we will uh, go through that uh, with the function that's built in. And uh, back to you, over, over to Mr. James. So before we get into the programming, we're going to show you something special that Derek can talk about. We go to sensors. So ultrasonic distance sensor. Now, if you look at the code, there's just the example code. And then at the bottom, there's a note. So it says the valid digital pairs for the trigger and echo pins are zero and one, two and three, four and five, six and seven, eight and nine, and 10 and 11. What this means is you can have up to six ultrasonic sensors on the robot. However, you're only gonna use two. One thing to notice, these pairs must be used. So you can't split it up saying my trigger is on zero, but my echo is on a list. You must use that pair. And the pairing is always trigger, echo, trigger, echo, trigger, echo. You don't want to put your trigger on one and your echo on zero, then it won't work. Your trigger must be on the X value and your echo is on the Y value in the coordinate here. All right. Now we can go on to program. So to use the ultrasonic sensor, we're going to import the ultrasonic class. So private ultrasonic, as we can see here. I'm going to call it sonic. Let's create the instance. So our trigger pin, if we remember what Derek is that was saying, was on pin eight. And our echo pin was on pin nine. Now, if we look, we have a pairing of eight and nine, which is a valid pair, eight and nine. So we're good to go. But now we still need to create an accessor method to see the actual distance that the ultrasonic sensors output. So we're going to go public double yes, sonic distance. So what I've done here is I've said public so we can be accessed from outside training.java. I want to return a double and I'm saying get the sonic distance of the method. And I put in a parameter called Boolean many. This is because you can read the ultrasonic value in a metric format or in an imperial format. So if we set this true, then it will read the metric. And if it's false, it'll read the imperial. So let's go through. So we're going to go sonic dot ping as we first want to send the trigger out we then have to create a small delay as you see here there's a error on timer and it's because we need to import the timer class now you can see 
there are multiple timer classes. We want to import the one from WPI. So it's the first. We can then read the distance. I'm going to put an uh, if statement here. So if metric equals equals true, return on the get range mm, which is the range in millimeters. Else, I'm going to return on the get range in inches, which is for impurity. So what I've done now is, if Boolean is true, goes in here, true, we'll then return the range in a metric format. Otherwise, we are returning the range in an imperial format of inches. It's up to you which one you use, and that's why we do it this way. Now we're going to add the Java dot comment. I'm going to say this method returns the distance from the ultrasonic at a space metric. True or false for a metric or imperial returns millimeters if metric is true and inches if metric is false. All right, and that's it for the sonic, ultrasonic distance. Now there was a question here, so I think So the reason that there is a special pin combination is because the uh, on the VMX so so error error asks why there's a special pin combination required. Yeah. So on the VMX, the all the pins here actually go into the main controller on the VMX board itself, where it's then processed and sent to the Raspberry Pi. And through that processing, there's different counters and timers that are configured. And for the ultrasonic class, we need specific pin combinations so that it's on the same timer and counter in order for the trigger and pulse to work accurately. Hopefully that answers your, your question, Erhard. It's to, um, to simplify things for you. How's that? Um, is, is one way. And then he asked if the timer delay was method or millisecond delay. So the timer class is by default in seconds. Yeah. If I was to reshare my screen here again, I can show you. If we hover over delay, we can see that the parameter here is seconds. So I am delaying here for five months. Yeah, we'll be showing the all the sensors at once when we've gone through the presentation. So shall pass and we can show the readout of the ultrasonic. Um, we will do that. So once we code all the sensors into the project, then we're gonna show the values and the readouts from them as well. I think we're going to do that in the, um, you can show it in the shuffleboard or yeah. we'll show that in the shuffleboard um, so that you can see how you can get all of that output the way that we did it yesterday um, for those values, okay? All right, so that is um, the code to begin to do your project for the ultrasonic distance sensor. You know, essentially what we're doing here is we're creating one sample project to do every sensor and every actuator Okay, that's inside of the collection so that you can use this right now or when you get going to test functionality um, when trying to build and design your robot. Okay, so that's uh, that's why we, um, we go through and we do this. All right, so let me just uh, skip back over here. 
make sure I'm back into good old Zoom. And this is the one that we really want. And I'm just going to close off the little control. Okay. So what we're going to do now is going to do um, basic control of the DC motor. So inside of your collection, you have the um, sharp IR sensor, you have the ultrasonic distance sensor, and you have the Cobra line follower sensor, uh, and then you have uh, limit switches as well. The limit switches can be used either on the uh, motor inputs or as a separate um, basic um, input output. Okay. Um, when we do motor control now, what we do is we do motor control using the Titan Quad. So why is it called the Titan Quad? Because it controls um, four DC motors. Uh, we limit you in world skills to having four DC motors. It's part of that design criteria that I told you that you must uh, work within, okay? Uh, we're not saying that we cannot control more than that, um, but for uh, the competition, you get limited to four DC motors. It's a design constraint, okay? Um, basically, one thing to remember about the Titan Quad is it requires a 12 volt um, power. Um, there's two ports that are here that can be connected in, in, uh, in parallel if you wish, okay? Um, what I did was I took this from the docks and I basically have the numbers here in my PowerPoint slide. They correspond to what you are gonna be wiring up right now if you were connecting one motor, okay? Or our sample code, okay? So you will see that we have the power input and the power output. So the power output would go out to the VMX Pi, okay? Um, or to the servo power block, okay? You can, you can chain them together. We are gonna use that CAN bus input, um, high side yellow, low side green. And we are gonna be using M2 for the motor output, okay? Um, in addition to M2, we are going to be using the encoder port, okay? Um, 20 for the quadrature, um, quadrature, I'm having trouble speaking this morning, quadrature encoder uh, input. Okay, so that's why we labeled those um, for you so that you can see them uh, and pick those. And why do we pick M2? Because M2 is where we have the little, uh, the little labels. Okay, that's why. So everything will get, uh, will get wired up for that. The new motor, um, uh, the Maverick DC motor that we use, here's the, uh, the specs on it. All right, from the data sheet, if you're looking for it, uh, when you are going to put it together. So there's a 12 volt DC motor at a 1 to 61 gear ratio. Okay, um, so that you can see that. Um, you'll notice, for instance, the stall current is at 13 amps, but I don't think you would ever be able to get there because you'll blow something else first. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. Not anything on the controller. Yeah, not anything on the controller. But it's rated to 20 amps. Yeah, so you're rated up to 20 amps, but for our world scale purpose, this is the motor um, that you will be using as you go through. A little bit of principle here on uh, the quadrature encoder, right? So that you, just if you don't have a, a basic background behind it on um, how it works. So the motor does have an encoder um, integrated on the back of the motor shaft, okay? Um, and the encoder cables are also integrated now and supplied with the motors. Uh, did we separate them or are they one piece? You cannot know so correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So when you get the uh, yeah, there we go. So when you when you get the motor, the power is wired for the motor, uh, but the encoder cable is there. And if you don't use the encoder when you're powering the motor, you can pull the encoder cable off. Okay. Um, so we decided to provide those um, separate. It's just to clean up your uh, your wiring a little bit if you wanted to do that. All right. So some encoder theory, I'm not going to insult um, anybody's uh, intelligence here um, on that. One thing to remember is that the count per revolution uh, from the motor directly is 12 and with the gear ratio of one to 61 on the output shaft, we get 732 counts per revolution, okay? Or 732 ticks, okay? We were just discussing this because I'm writing a document um, on theory for curriculum right now. And I just asked James, do you care if I use ticks or counts? Um, and a lot of times they can be um, interchangeable. So this is what's gonna happen. And remember that this is one complete revolution on the encoder shaft, which is our CPR is 12. Okay, when we do the math on the output shaft, we get 732, okay? If you had then gone and added, for instance, um, a different gear, 
So some of our external gears or maybe the bevel gears. So we did that bevel drive robot with the motor mounted inside. Remember that that map also has to be brought in because the output shaft is now going to have different gearing on it. And if you're using our uh, bevel gears that are included in a two to one ratio, your count there will double. Right. So you're going to double that 732 on the output shaft, okay, is what you are going to do. So a little bit of math. Um, so that's why we put the principle up there um, so that we can see it. So I will let James flip back over and we'll go over the DC motor control. Stop. So we're now going to set up the Titan to program. So I'm going to add a new section here called motors. So in here, I'm going to create a new instance for, of the Titan. I'll not create, just create a new Titan quad. And I'm going to call it motors. Very simple. I'm just going to create a new section here. Motors in the constructor. Now we have to create a new instance of motor. So motors equals new Titan quad. Now the device ID by default on the Titan is 42. I'm going to put 42 there. And then we, if we look at the constructor, Let's uh, do a different one. If I go here, as I'm typing it out, we can see the inputs required for the Titan quad. So in this case, I need device ID, which is 42. The frequency that I want the motor to be at, I'm going to choose 15,600. And this is a range of 0 to 20,000. And it's up to you which one you use. I find this is a good value. You can go the full 20,000 if you want. You can go a lower value. It's, it's based on your own testing. And this will set the frequency that the motor spins at on the tank. You can even make each motor a different frequency if you wanted to. And as we showed, we are connected to motor two. So I'm going to put a two. And we've now set up a new motor control. However, we actually want to now set the speed of the motor. In order to do that, we're going to create a mutator method. So public void as we're not returning anything. Set motor speed. Double. So if you notice, there's no error now because we're not returning any, anything. So we could leave this blank and the compiler would be happy. However, we do want to set a value to the motor. So we're going to go motor dot set. So you can see here, sets the output of the Titan quad as a percentage from minus one to one. Let's click on that. And you see the speed matches already, so there's no need to change the value. If we hover over here, we can then see percentage value between minus one and one, where zero is our stop. I'm going to add this here. Set this method. We'll set the speed of the motor on Titan Quad or two. Can add a space. Say the speed is a um, minus one. Set the point of the beam more specific. And we're going to say zero is stopped. 
So if I was to pass a value of minus one to in here, it will set this speed to 100% in the uh, counterclockwise direction. If I was to set the speed to one, it would set the speed to 100% in the clockwise direction. And then if the speed was zero, the motor would be stopped. Now there is one more thing or parameter that we can add for the motor speed. Well, for the motor in general. So if we go up to the top inside our constructor, we're gonna do this, motor dot set inverted. Here if motor So by adding the motor dot set inverted right after the initialization, what we're doing is that if we start moving the motor by put, passing in a one here, and it starts moving in the opposite direction of what we want, we want to invert the motor. The reason for this is in programming, we always want the positive value to be a forward direction and a negative value to be a reverse direction. Otherwise, some of the math algorithms won't work. So this set inverted can be called here. And if the motor is going backward, when it should be going forward, we can then change this to true, true, and it will invert the motor out. However, we don't actually know if we need to invert it yet or not, so I'm going to leave it as false, and then we can change it later if need be. And that's it. All right, so there's the um, initial DC motor. Like I said, we're going to put all this project together um, after, so probably in the last uh, 45 minutes or so, we'll, we'll, everything will be put together and you will uh, you will be able to see that, okay? Um, going out. The frequency related to speed. So the frequency of the motor can be related to speed, but it's more related to how much range of speed you can control on the robot. The speed itself, that parameter is the actual speed, but the, uh, the frequency is how often the motor is turned on and off to control that speed. So if you have a higher frequency, you have a wider bandwidth that you can use to control the motor. But if you have a lower frequency, let's say 100, you don't have as much bandwidth to control the motor and the motor responds slower to a change in value. Okay. Um, but that's a whole motor theory that we're not going to really cover in training. Yeah, it's, it's, uh... does that mean that for speed equals one RPM equals 100? No. So the speed is a percentage base. So if I were to put in one, I'm essentially saying I want the motor to spin at 100%. If I were to use 0 0.5, I want the motor to spin at 50%. It's not an RPM calculation. In order to do RPM, you have to take the encoder value as well and then convert it into a vector feed base and then output it in your own side. Right. So that answer, I hope that answers your question, Ms. Sheets. And um, I'm just making this before I answer the next question. Um, I, I'm making a few notes because as people ask questions, um, so one of one of the things that we do here is, uh, you know, we're doing a world skills robot. We're not essentially teaching a course in, in DC motor theory. So we put a little bit of background information there, but it's a good question. And as I begin to add stuff to the separate curriculum, I, I'm making notes because if you ask the questions then maybe you want to teach that in your class and use this for this. So I'm going to make sure that I add that um, theory um, separately into the curriculum. So one person asked, will we use the same code for each of the motors connected to each of the ports on the tiny quad? And then just change the ports of connection. So if I wanted to add another motor on the Titan, I would go in here and I'd say now uh, motor two, let's just call it that equals new Titan quad. We're going to use the same address, 42. I can put in a different frequency for the motor. So let's say 10,000 this time. And I'm going to use motor zero. I'm going to go zero. So now I've defined a new motor on motor zero. 
However, I do need to add the actual uh, initialization here. So tight end quad motor. So now you can see we've defined the new motor. So if you wanted to use all four motors, you'd have to have four new instances of tight end quad created in order to do that. Right. And 42 is the that's correct. That's another question. I think it's just Earhart. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding, Earhart. Uh, I installed the vendor library for Titan. Doesn't show in the project. Did you build the the code? So what happens is when you first import the vendor library, you have to be able to build it. Otherwise, it won't work. So I'll error, and if you pay attention, I will delete my vendor library here and re-add it so that you can see how it's done. Right. So error installed the vendor library, but it's not uh, it's not showing up. So James is going to go and uh, delete his and then uh, reinstall it. So to delete a vendor library, I'm going to hit manage vendor libraries again. It's my first one, and you can see here manage current libraries. If I click on that, we can see the current library is installed. I'm going to choose Studica and I'm going to hit OK. And now that's gone. As you can see, it's out of the vendor library folder. If I were to build my project right now, you'll see all these errors pop up because that library is no longer there. So now we want to add the library again. So I have to go back and grab the link. So I'm going to go to programming adding vendor libraries. And if you notice here, you see Studica's Titan library. I'm going to copy this link. Control. Go back into manage vendor libraries. Install new libraries online. Paste in the link, as you can see here. Hit enter. It'll then ask me, it is recommended to run a build after a vendor update to ensure dependencies are installed correctly. Would you like to do this now? I would say yes. It has now installed the libraries from the internet and you can see that there are no more errors anymore as the library is installed. One thing you need to note is that you must be connected to the internet when you install a library. So if you're doing this on a separate computer that is not connected to the internet, it will not be able to install the library and your build will fail. All right. So um, give that a try, um, Earhart. And uh, when we take our next break, if there's uh, questions, we can do that. And then if there's still issues, you know, we can do the old uh, remote in sometime and uh, and have a look at uh, at what what you're gonna work through and go together okay so hopefully you'll um, you'll get everything there as we go through um, good questions uh, good feedback because this is a small um, uh, limited training but I like the questions so I have all these notes written down um, because I am actually just at this point in time when we're sitting here um, writing uh, some curriculum on on uh, DC motor control, uh, believe it or not. Um, just a couple points. Um, there's one thing uh, we are using the term um, imperial. I hope that that is not confusing to anybody. Uh, about 25 years ago, I wrote a textbook and I used the term imperial on it. And in, when it was published in the United States, they told me that imperial was a margin. It uh, was imperial was a margarine. It was not a system of measurement. So we we refer to that term um, inch or, or metric and imperial here. Um, so metric or inch, metric um, imperial. So I just hope that that doesn't uh, doesn't confuse anybody. Oh, okay. and someone asked, do you guys have a date to launch the C++ plus examples? There are examples for each center on the docs page, but for the actual example project, uh, I'm still in the process of writing it. And because of training, I haven't been able to go back and finish it. So it might come out next week or the week after. Just keep looking at that GitHub page and eventually it'll be there. 
Okay. But for the actual each sensor, there is an example on the uh, docs page already. Yeah, you're 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 correct, Sheldon. It's okay. It's just boy, did I ever get blasted when I used the word imperial, and I didn't even think they had imperial margarine in the U.S. So, so. someone asked, "Are you going to submit this example project for the World Skills Example Project?" That the, the example what we're doing right now is the example project. We're just starting from scratch. So there is no need to submit this project as the one that's there is already completed and good to go. All you need to do is just download it, open it up in VS Code, and you're good to go. Right. So we're we're not inventing anything new here. This is the example project that's already there. Um, and uh, like James said, probably uh, next week, you know, we've been doing work for this training and a, and a couple of other things. Um, we'll put the C++ uh, project up there. Okay, the guys are just trying to uh, finish something that we think is kind of important for you guys to have because um, we're always trying to improve things. And once that's uh, that's completed, I, I discovered a small error in it. It's probably just me, but we're just cleaning that up. Um, we will do that as we go forward. Um, okay, so we were gonna. You want to do the servo motor, and then we'll take the break. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll do the servo motor, um, and then we'll take a break because I think that that's the last thing I have. In, in my part of the presentation anyways. Uh, so let's just go back and we'll do uh, we'll do a couple of little things with this. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the basic control um, of the servo motor. The 2021 collection um, has what we call the multi-mode smart servo, okay? Um, this servo will allow you to have either continuous or standard rotation of the servo. So with one servo now, um, we can control that, all right? There's some background um, information here uh, on the servo when you are going to do it. And there is what we call the servo programmer that James will uh, will talk about uh, with you um, that is included in your uh, World Skills collection, okay? Um, so we'll just go over the, the basic setup for that as well. In order to run the servo, you need to use the servo power block that's included. Okay, this is to ensure that the proper power is supplied to the servos uh, because we can't output enough power directly from the uh, VMX from the controller side. All right. Okay. Um, simple servo wiring is here. Um, what you're gonna use with the uh, servo motor, it's a servo motor has a three, three wire DuPont or PWM cable on it, okay? Um, you are going to connect it to the servo power block. So you're going to come from the high current DIO. Uh, remember that those high current DIOs are all configured by default to output. So on day one, we had talked about the fact that those are all outputs. So channel 12 through 21 are outputs. If you remember that there's a jumper where you could convert them to inputs, okay, on the uh, inside when you open the case, but we chose to by default configure them all for outputs. And the reason is, is that generally we wanna control servo motors, with them, right? So um, with that, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take a three wire DuPont cable. You're gonna come out of the channel 12 on the high current DIO. You will go into an input on the servo power block. And then the output of the corresponding servo power block in this case um, is where we plug the servo motor in, okay? You need to do supply power to the um, servo power block and that's done from the Titan, okay, with that two pin JST cable. So nice and simple, everything's labeled. So you'll see in my picture, the labeling is here. So the ground, the, the voltage, okay, the supply and the signal. So as long as you don't wear these off, all you gotta do is look at your pictures. Same thing here, everything's labeled, so you can just wire everything up uh, and follow the picture. So we make the, uh, the wiring easy for you. The nice thing about that is that World Skills, when they go and they ask you if your wiring's all labeled, um, we've done it for you. So remember when I talked on day one about those core points, those core points are there, right? All you gotta do is put a little number on for your corresponding motors or servos. Um, the rest of it is all labeled going forward. The sample code is provided for the servo motor um, in both Java um, and C++ on the docs page. You can cut those out and paste those in, but I think because James loves to type, 
he is going to do this from scratch for you um, going forward. And I don't know if you want to talk about the Smart Servo Programmer before um, or after. Okay, but I just put a picture up. There's your Smart Servo uh, Programmer. And I think he'll talk uh, a little bit about that as well, um, looking at it and going forward. Let's do this and continue. Show the code. Okay, so what he'll do is he'll he'll do this with continuous and then he'll show you the code for both. So I'll pass this over to James. So we're going to switch over to the VS code again. So we wanna add a standard servo and a continuous servo in order to show what's going on. Now, if we go back to the WPI channel addressing and we scroll down to the PWM addressing, as shown here, there are 28 uh, possible PWM pins on the VMS. So if we notice here, the high current PIO is where the channel zero starts, where it's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. In this case, as shown with Derek's image, we are using PWM zero, and we're gonna use PWM one for a continuous servo. So I'm going to create a servo, so private servo. Now, if you notice, there are two servo libraries here. There's the servo from Studica, and then there's the servo class from WPI. We're gonna use the one from Studica because the one from WPI doesn't have the same uh, range of what our sensor does, and you will miss out. As their servo is calibrated for zero to 180 degrees, where ours can do zero to 300 degrees, and you'd be missing out on a whole bunch of degrees. I'm going to name it servo. Then we're also going to create the continuous servo. So we're going to private servo. And if you notice here, there's a continuous servo. I'm, I'm going to name this servo C for continuous. We're not going to create the inputs for this, or the instances. So we're going to have servo is equal to new servo on port zero from what if we remember was plugged into my current DIO pin 12, which is PWM zero. And then we're gonna create a continuous servo. Oops, see, is equal to new servo continuous and the channel is one. Or if we remember, we're plugged into here, which is one. Then we're going to create a mutator method in order to set the speed and the um, angle that we want to use those servos at. So public void set servo angle double angle. Actually, we're going to call this degrees. So if you remember, we have servo dot set angle, and you see it matches the degrees. So what happen is if we set a degree value to here, it'll set, it'll change this servo to that degree. Let's add a comment here. So this method will set the angle of the servo. Add a space. Valid range is zero to 300 degrees. And as it's a double, the zero to 300 is the integer, which means I can do 0 0.5 degrees if I want that little bit of extra accuracy and it'll move it to that little bit of extra accuracy. You might not see it, but it's enough that it will move just that little tiny bit. That's what nice, what, that's what's nice about this method. Now, if we're doing a continuous motor servo, which actually turns into a motor. 
So we're going to call it public void set servo speed double speed. I'm going to say servo C. If you remember, that's what we called our continuous servo dot set. And we're going to use the double speed. And as such, now let's add a comment in here. So this method will set the speed of the continuous circle. <laughs> Did you spell something wrong, Gates? Oh, oh so all the parameter time. speed. So let's do the minus one to one. So this acts just like a normal DC motor at where zero is stopped. So what will happen is that when a servo is configured to be continuous, it will act as a DC motor at 50 RPM, which is what the servo is spin at. As such, we treat it as a motor, and that's why we do it this way. So you'll see it'll have very similar calls to what the Titan does, except different constructors and everything to add to the servo. And that's how we have now defined to set the servo angle and how to set the servo speed. So now we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back at 1020 in order and we will clean everything up and deploy it to the training board and show everyone everything. Cool. All right. Is everybody at, uh, at 1020? I got a couple more notes to make here based on some more questions and uh, good to go.
Hi everyone, uh, so we're back now. Derek's just stepped out for a second. Uh, so we had some questions in the chat. So someone asked, how do I output data from sensors and such? Uh, we're going to show you now how to output the data, uh, the data and sensors. Uh, we're using a different HUD, not a terminal. So we'll show that now. So here's the uh, the code. So what we want to do is we want to add the shuffleboard. The shuffleboard is a specific uh, user interface that's paired with a control station to allow you to output uh, data and stuff live for you to see. So I'm going to create a new section here called shuffleboard. Notice that this is before the constructor. So in here, we're going to go private shuffle or tab is equal to shuffleboard dot get tab. We're going to call it training and done. Let me know it's giving me an issue because I haven't uh, imported. Oh, I forgot to give it a name. That's why. There we go. Yeah, name. Now we have an up imported shuffleboard. So I'm going to click on the yellow light bulb, import it. Same thing with shuffleboard itself. Import it. And there we go. And no more errors. Now we want to create a new network table entry for each uh, sensor that we want to output. A network table entry is how Shuffleboard works, is that it uses a network table on, so like Ethernet packets and everything, to pass data between the robot and the computer. And in those packets, it houses the data itself. So if we create a new network table entry, so private network. Tree. servo position is equal to tab as just you're gonna explain that right yeah okay good math We'll put this in and uh, so that you can see it, and then it'll just go through that uh, explanation of, of uh, what's there for you. typing. Okay. So let's go over what I just added. It can be quite confusing. I'm confused, so we're going to explain it. So we've created a new network table entry called servo, which stands for servo position. We've used tab, which we can see as we set a new network, a new shuffleboard uh, tab called training. So we said in tab, add a new uh, widget called servo position. And then the last parameter here is the default value of that uh, servo position. And then we want to use the widget built into a shuffleboard called number slider. So we're telling it we want to use servo position as the widget number slider. And then we want to say the number slider 
has the properties, so dot with properties, of a min value of zero and a max value of 300. But inside here, we are using a built-in Java utility function, as we can see, import Java util map. This maps any output sent to the number slider as a min value of zero and a max value of 300. That's what we're doing here. And then the last part here actually gets the entry from the network table entry. Why did you pick the value of zero through 300, James? Because that is the max range of the circle. Correct, okay. Thought I'd interject there. Uh, if your driver station only has SFX and smart dashboard, then you have an old version of the uh, driver station and you need to update. However, we won't be covering that in this training. Okay. So now let's add a, Another one for if we wanted to set the speed of a continuous servo. So we're going to go private. Although we don't want to type it out again. So what are we going to do? Copy and paste. So copy, paste. We're just going to have to bring this one over. We're going to change the name to servo speed. And now we want to change the actual name of the widget to servo speed. We still want to use the slider. However, our values are not zero to one. I mean, zero to 300. It's going to be minus one to one. As if you remember, when we created the servo speed here, our range is minus one to one. So now we're going to add all the other entries in order to read the sensors that we've created. So I'm going to create private network entry. We're going to call this one sharp IR. It's equal to tab add sharp IR distance. The default value is zero. And then as we're not adding any parameters or defining a specific widget, we can just say get entry. There we go. I'm going to copy this for the other sensors. So now we want one for the ultrasonic. We want one for the Cobra value. And we want one for the Cobra voltage. I'm just going to line everything up again. I'm going to rename this to, oops, uh, caps on, ultrasonic. And here we're going to have Cobra raw. And then Cobra voltage. And of course, we're going to have to rename everything. Oh, I don't have to rename that. But here we're going to name it ultra sonic distance Cobra raw value and Cobra voltage. So we've now added the shuffleboard entries required to create the widgets on the Shuffleboard app. But there's one last thing we need to add. And that is the actual periodic run that will run constantly whenever anything is happening. So I'm going to go back, override, to override the current periodic loop. So public void period. So now what happens is this loop will run every 20 milliseconds based on the main robot loop here. 
So we're going to go. First off, we want to set servo angle, if we remember. However, we have one that's set like this. So what we're going to do is inside here, we want to actually grab the value that's coming from this tab here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say servo position, if we remember, dot get double, and the default value is zero. So now what we put here is that when this slider, depending on what value it is between zero and 300, it will output into this servo angle, which will then go to the set servo angle, which is here, and tell it, okay, I want you to do whatever this value is from the slider, and it will move to that angle. Let's do one for the continuous servo as well. So we have set servo speed, servo speed, Uh, get double, and the default value is zero. So now what we've done is we've set the continuous servo speed based on the second slider that we did, that we put here of a value between minus one and one. But now we also want to output these values from our sensors. They're a bit easier. So we're going to call, for example, sharp IR dot set double, and then we're gonna have the double value. Now, what, what do we put in this value? Well, we're actually going to call our sharp IR, um, where is it here? Get IR distance. So inside here, I'm gonna type get IR distance. And now this will get the IR distance and update that shuffleboard tab to show Input. Now we want to show the Cobra raw that set. If you remember, the Cobra raw is an integer. So we're going to set believe you can do set number, which is an integer number. And we're gonna say a get Cobra raw value. Well, maybe I typed in that, uh, what we did it wrong there. An error there. Oh, right, because we need to find the channel. Yeah. So we are on channel zero, so I'm just gonna pop that in zero. I should just copy and make it easier. There, it was get raw cover, but not get cover raw value. So now we want to display the voltage as well. So we'll, this one's a double, so we can do double. And it would be get, let's double check what we call it. So get cover voltage. And we also want it on zero. Keep spelling everything wrong. And then the last one we have here is that we defined was the ultrasonic sensor. So if we go down here, let's look for get sonic distance and we want it in metric or imperial? Metric. Metric. So we're going to set metric to true. And that's all we need to do in periodic. Now, as we're running short on time, I'm not going to go into setting up the commands and the gamepad and everything, because we will do that tomorrow. So I'm going to save this currently, and we're going to swap over to the example project. Now we see the example project 
is exactly the same as what we just did. As you can see here, everything is the same. The only thing is we did not put in the continuous servo. So let's add the continuous servo. So if you remember in the example project, we created an overloaded method. So you had set servo angle and then a set servo angle with a parameter. Oh, am I sharing the wrong screen? Oh, yeah, it's the wrong screen here. Am I sharing the wrong screen? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Sharing the wrong screen. Oh, but here we go. We're there back go. on the actual one. So here is the example project back again. As you can see, everything is still the same. But in this example project that we provided, there is an overloaded method on the servos. So you have a set servo angle with no parameters and then a set servo angle with a parameter. The one, the parameter with the set servo angle with no parameter uses the value taken from the, the shovel board. As you can see, we have the servo dot set angle, and then we have that position that we set before. Same thing with the get servo, set servo speed for the continuous servo. So I'm gonna add this here, set, Servo speed, here we go. So now when we update, move the motor, the servo to a continuous servo, we'll be able to set the speed of the servo. I'm going to save this. We're gonna turn on the robot. In the meantime, I'm going to open up the driver station. Okay, as you can see, we're not currently connected. And now that the robot's fully booted up, I'm going to connect to the robot. As you can see, minus training dash one, two, three, four. Let's connect. As you can see, when I connect, the communications and robot codes start on the driver's side. Uh, Sheldon. We're currently developing a driver station that we can package to everyone. So we're not going to be showing where to, maybe Derek can explain it better. Yeah, so we've got a, a new um, updated driver station, okay? Um, specifically for world skills, okay? Um, it, it runs a little cleaner and has some, some code. So we're just uh, doing the final testing and packaging that, and then we're going to uh, distribute that to everybody. So this is a licensed driver station, but it had to run some extra background code that we did not need it to run. So there's a little bit too much overhead on here. Um, so everything, everything works. What happened was I installed it on my system and I got um, Inuit lettering pop up. So we just wanna make sure that I don't have a font installed on my system um, that somebody else may have on their system that's causing okay. yeah. that's causing an issue. So, so you'll get a new one shortly. Sheldon asked how to open Shuffleboard. Uh, Shuffleboard is downloaded when you install VS Code. However, it only starts running when you have the proper driver station working. You go to the settings here. You'll see there's a dashboard type here, and you want to choose Shuffleboard. And then the Shuffleboard will launch, and you can use it. So if you remember in the code, we created a tab called training. So this training tab, you can now see in the shuffleboard, there is a smart, smart dashboard, there's a live window, and then there's a tab here called training. I'm gonna click on training. And now I have all those, uh, different shuffleboard network entries that we created. 
As such, we can see the Sharp IR is currently working. The Cobra is working. The Navex is working. We didn't do the Navex because we'll cover it tomorrow. The ultrasonic is not working because the robot needs to be enabled for the ultrasonic to work. The servo is not working as the robot needs to be enabled for the motors to actuate as a safety feature. And the servo speed won't work because we have not configured the servo as a continuous servo. Uh, someone asked, do we have a Linux compatible driver station that supports shuffleboard? Yes. Uh, we are currently in the development of creating a driver station that will work on Linux, Mac, and Windows. Yeah. Be probably be released in the next week or so. Mm -hmm. So you'll all get it. For Windows. For Windows. The Mac and Linux might require a bit more time. Yeah, we just gotta double check. So if I enable the robot here by hitting enable, we heard Oh, the servo move. And we can also see the ultrasonic sensor is now outputting its data. So if I were to hold my hand here, you can see the distance changes in millimeters. And then here we have the sharp IR changes in centimeters. We have the Cobra value. We have the voltage. Let's bring this closer. So here's the raw value. Here's the voltage value. If I were to hold a white piece of paper, let's change it over underneath the Cobra like such you can see bring it closer the voltage change as we're now at 0 0.5 volts and a raw value of 217. if i take away the paper we're now at the max value as we're either too high or we're over a dark surface and in this case we're over a dark surface so let's view the servo if you notice here, here's the slider with the servo position. If I move this, you can hopefully sort of see the servo move. I'm going to stop sharing so that you can see the full screen of the servo. Here. So now I'm sliding, right now the servo is in position zero. If I move it to 75 degrees, it's now shifted 75 degrees. Let's go all the way to 300 degrees. So it's now moved 300 degrees. If I go back to zero, it's now at zero. If I want to go to 150, it's now at 150. And you can see I'm slowly moving it along and how responsive it is to that slider. So if I wanted to pass a manual value in, it'd be very easy. So now we're going to quickly go over how to use the servo programmer to change it to a continuous mode servo so that we can show you the servo speed. But first off, for safety reasons, I'm going to disable the robot. If you notice the blinking light here is purple, when I hit disable, it switches to blue, green, red, which means it's, it's disabled and the motors will no longer move. So let's show how to do this. First, I'm just gonna wire the connections back in. No, the one here. Okay. So essentially what I've done is I will put it here for you to zoom in as the servo is programmer is over here for me. When I first plug in the servo programmer, it will blink. If you notice, there's a C and an S here. When flip to C, it's in continuous. If we flip it to S, it is in standard mode. Right now, I have mine set to C as I want it to go to the servo, the continuous mode. So I'm gonna hold down the P here for five seconds. And then I will see it blink, which will tell me I've now programmed the servo to continuous mode. I can now test that it's in continuous hold mode by pressing the S at the bottom here.
this sets it to a sweep mode. If I press S one more time, it's now in manual mode. So I can click on the right key here and it will constantly spin in one direction. If I hit the P in the middle, it'll stop the servo. If I hit the L, it'll move in the other direction. I can show you guys here. This is a great way because you can use one servo um, and change the modes. Um, a lot of people would use the servo uh, programmer as well just to test servos to make sure that they're working yeah. correctly. So now that we set the servo to continuous mode, I'm now going to unplug the programmer again, move the servo back to its original slot. I'm going to change the cable, which is currently plugged into PWM0 to PWM1 to be in the continuous port that we've defined. If we remember, make sure it's in the right. So now that when I run, enable the program, the motor, if, you, if I move the dial, it should move the motor. Oh, it's a bit weird because the motor is not. I'm just trying to make sure everything's done correctly. So you heard there the uh, the motor was spinning. Just needed to change one thing. Okay. So if we see now, the motor, the servo is now spinning continuously, which is the new benefit of our servo, because they can now be run in continuous or standard mode by quickly flipping it over via the programmer. This makes it nice of if you need three continuous servos, you can make three continuous servos, or if you want three standard servos, you can use three standard servos. The reason we did this is now it creates more optionality for teams to use. So if I wanted to go really slow, you can see I'm now moving the servo really slow. If I want it to go faster, I can. If I want it to go in the other direction, I can do that as well. So let me show my screen here again so that you guys can see the slider working. So here's the servo speed. If I move it in this direction, you can hear the motor spinning. If I now move to zero, it's slowed down. Let me go half speed, moving nice and slow. Now I can go really fast and remember. And it's just as simple as that. If I wanted to move the motor, I can then use the controller to move it. And we didn't show the gamepad or the command today because we will show it tomorrow morning as we finish off the example project.
I'm going to stop screen sharing here so that we can show a close up video. Here is the controller. This is the Y axis on the right stick. When I move it forward, you can see the motor move. When I move it backward, the motor moves in the other direction. And we can go slow. Or we can go fast. And if you notice, if I move any of the other joysticks, the motor won't move as it's only in the Y axis. We also notice if I gun the motor and then I hit disable the robot, pay attention to the light, it instantly stops the motor. This is a nice safety feature that was added. So if you were to e-stop your robot, hence turning off the power, or you can disable the robot from the computer, but also be able to e-stop the robot. Right. So there's a couple of things here. Um, we use the, the the joystick, and there'll be a joystick included in your um, 2021 collection. We use that for testing and for functionality right now. Um, so that's why it's added into the into the project, and you'll have it in the sample project. Uh, Sheldon was asking if we plug the controller into the computer. So I'm just going to show us where it is plugged in. Yeah, so he'll show you, Sheldon, where that uh, where that's plugged in. So if you yeah. notice the station here which is on my computer if i go to usb so you can see the wireless controller and i can press all the buttons and you can see the inputs coming here right so you, you have that functionality there's a lot of stuff that we're we're looking at adding here i mean one of the other reasons for that enable disable um, was generally for safety um, but the other thing that we will have the capability to do is to uh, through a master control, disable all robots. Okay, so you know as we go forward in world skills and we think about new cool things that we can do, um, you know we can enable and disable everybody's robot on the fly, for instance. Okay, so for those of you that have been there before and you're worried about this whole, the ten minutes is up. Did they stop? Well, in the future we'll just be able to go click, and the ten minutes is up, and everybody's robot will be disabled. All right, so these are some things that we, we think about going forward. So what we'll do um, tomorrow is we're gonna review that project so that you, you understand. Um, we will look at the orientation and the VMX uh, as well uh, tomorrow, and we're gonna complete the project both on the trainer, and I think we're gonna try to move, um, finish off the robot that I started to build uh, on Tuesday or Wednesday, Tuesday, and then we'll we'll create some sample code for that uh, robot as well um, tomorrow when we get going. So we'll finish off all of the projects. Okay, um, we'll stay on the line here for a little bit in case people have some more questions on the Q and A. Uh, and then remember that that Discord is active. Okay, it's not active all night for us. So remember that it's the training Discord. So we keep it open when we're doing the uh, the training only. Um, for questions after that, please remember. Uh, so next week, the week after, you know, don't throw something up on that Discord because um, we may or may not be on that channel at that time. Um, so you would put that on the World Skills Support form. Okay. So um, thanks, everybody. We'll see you in the morning. And uh, if there's any more questions, we'll be online here for a little while because I see that, that we're trying to help good old Earhart out and we're good to go. Earhart, I like it that you're actually uh, on board here and you're, uh, you're doing stuff. Okay, that excites me. That's cool.
Sheldon, there was no PowerPoint yesterday. It was just the video which we uploaded and emailed out to everybody. Yep. We can't PowerPoint you to death. Well, we can if you want, but... Uh, Earhart, I sent you a message on Discord about the driver station for you to test your stuff.